Hi y'all. So in this video I'm going to talk a little bit more about Kraut's Discord server, the Muppet Farm, and some information that I've been made privy to that I've been sitting on for a while to give people's uh, memories an opportunity to lapse a little bit uh, and for other reasons. But anyway, I have talked to some of the scientists who actually went there to the Muppet Farm uh, throughout its duration to try to assist them in actually understanding real science and really trying to grapple with the issues. And uh, anyway, it wasn't pretty. So one of the ringleaders, the Pied Piper there, is a guy named Sandre, uh, who I've spoken to uh, several times in the past. I've gone on some of his um, live streams, I guess they are, uh, back in, I think, 2015. I went to one or two, and I never went back. And I get invited, and I always had other things to be doing at the moment, like collecting and naming my dust bunnies, uh, sorting my navel lint, really important things. And it's because the guy's not as smart as he thinks he is. He's, he's clever by quarters. He's too clever by quarters. So we were having a conversation. There was another mathematician there. And we were talking about um, four-dimensional projections and three-dimensional space. And somehow or other, we were talking about a tesseract. And Sandre was saying that he can actually picture what a real tesseract looks like. And I'm like, no, you can't. No, no one can. No mathematician, no physicist, no, no, no one has the capacity to imagine what an actual fourth dimensional object looks like. And we were talking about why it is that we teach uh, the way that we do in, in lower dimensions. And it's so that way it's to build confidence in, in the method that's used to analyze these things. Because once you get to higher dimensional, once you get to higher dimensional objects, you have no intuitive understanding of what they look like. You, you really can't grapple with it. You have to do it analytically. You have to do it mathematically. And he was trying to say that he can. I'm like, no, no, you can't. And so, you know, there's a video, several of them on YouTube, that you can find of, uh, of a tesseract being rotated. That's not actually what it is. That, that is a projection. It's a three-dimensional projection of a fourth-dimensional object. Whenever you project an object down to a lower dimension, you always lose information such that, from what you see from its projection, you cannot reconstruct what the object uh, that made it looks like. And, uh, you know, if you, so if you see a shadow on a wall, you cannot reconstruct uh, perfectly the object that produces that shadow. When you draw on a board, like when you look at a, ma a map that tries to, you know, like reduce a globe to a two-dimensional space, you always have an error. You would not be able to perfectly recreate a globe from a map because of the error. You would need some more information. Anyway. And then in the other one, if I think it was two, in the other one we were talking about infinity, or maybe it was later in the same conversation, and he says that he can actually imagine infinity. I'm like, no, no, you can't. No one can. If you can imagine infinity, like, actually, not just imagine that there exists, like, a meta-imagination, like, there exists something called infinity, but actually imagine uh, a real infinity. Uh, there is a Fields Medal waiting for you, probably some Nobel Prizes to follow because you will be able to do some wonderful work. Anyway, I never went back because he's dumb. He was one of the ringleaders in, at the Muppet Farm. He was the, <laughs> I guess he was part of the intellectual heavyweight <laughs> that was going to bring the reckoning. <laughs> anyway, these guys had their asses handed to them by uh, a number of people, one of which was JF, uh, who is a professional biologist. He has a PhD in biology. Uh, I came in late to the game and I did my part. And then there's another guy called the Alternative Hypothesis. He's not a scientist. I think his uh, education is in history. He's an autodidact. Uh, who's a, he's, a white ethno, he's an ethno-nationalist. He's a white nationalist. He wants a white ethno-state. And he spent like a decade locked in some basement or some room somewhere with his boyfriend, refining his arguments, studying uh, this subject, just so that way he could you know, hand people's ass to them when he's confronted as he was doing with uh, Kraut and the Muppet Farm. So, uh, you know, he and his boyfriend have locked themselves in this room. They've done all this studying. They have such a huge boner for a white ethnostate that it's ironic they've spent all that time browning each other's meat. Who knew? Call me. Anyway, um, so that's just some of my background with San the Sandre guy. Now, uh, some of the discussions I had with the scientists who went into the, the server to talk to them in, involved uh, Sandre and some of the leaked audio 
that you can find here uh, involves Sandre talking about say, saying very stupid things like the only thing, well, this wasn't leaked audio, this was actually one of Kraut's videos um, the only thing that you can get from the data is the data this guy has very a very poor under for a chemistry student uh, for anyone actually has a very poor understanding of science if the only thing you can get from the data is the data you can't do science and moreover it's ironic that he would be saying that into a computer your computer does two major things uh, one at the front end and one at the back end uh, it t input output it takes in data and then it has some system but some method by which it compiles sorts uh, and, you know that data that is inputted and then it returns the output which is information data goes in information comes out uh, mathematics is the tool by which we sort data we analyze the data we interrogate data and derive from it the information that is embedded in the data that is not obvious from the data itself so this proposition that the only thing you can get from the data is the data means this guy should leave science. He should stop pretending to be any kind of serious scientific mind. He is not. He is a moron. I am constantly told about the superiority of the European education system. Listening to the leaked audios, the videos that have been produced by those Europeans, does not attest this fact. All of them, allegedly, ostensibly, putatively, are scientifically trained, except for Kraut, which is part of my problems with the uh, on the moral front with these... Um, Supposed scientists, like, giving this guy some tidbits of information, true or false, <coughs> and then sending him out into the world to, to preach their gospel. This is, you would not take, uh, I don't know, an introductory biology student, uh, tutor them for a couple of weeks and go, okay, uh, you know, I'm the professor, I'm done teaching for the term, uh, taking over my place will be the student who joined the class with you, I've taught him all he really needs to know, I'm sure you'll all do great. And then you're surprised when all your students fail the test, including the, the person whom you've tutored. That's what they've done to this guy. Uh, now, Kraut went into this willingly. He knew he didn't know shit, which is why he was like, I need to get some credentialed people, academics, please respond. But anyway, it, that's just a big problem there. Now, whenever you, if you're scientifically trained, or actually in any academic speciality, and I mean a real one, not like gender studies or feminist basket weaving underwater or whatever, I mean a, a real academic field, Whenever you give a, a talk about your field, or that field, to a general audience, there are always things that you are going to omit, which you would not omit, in an actual class on that subject. Because the, the candle, you know, it's not worth the candle to go through it. It's only going to serve to confuse people. So what you want to do is find useful analogies that are meaningful to people in their personal lives, that people have, you know, who are well-educated, but not specialists in your field, will be able to relate to, to get a general intuition about the dynamics of the field. It is not meant to be a rigorous uh, analysis, a rigorous explanation, a disquisition of the subject matter. If you want that, go to school. Go get a formal education in the subject, or get a boyfriend, brown his meat in a basement while you become an autodidact to spread the good news of white ethno-nationalism, or whatever it is. But anyway, so, among the many errors that Sandre made, and by the way, Sandre, I was really hoping you would actually follow through on making your video to me, uh, because I, I, I'm going to enjoy the opportunity of showing you just how, to, just how out of your league you actually are. So what was really interesting to me was Sandre's non-understanding of um, data collection, analysis, margins of error, and statistics, like it's it's very, very poor, which is strange for a chemistry student not to, who has taken statistics, supposedly, uh, to not understand really anything about statistics. But I guess that's not surprising. He studies science and he doesn't know that you can actually derive information from data beyond what just what the, the uh, raw facts attest uh, on their face. Anyway, so <laughs> let's, well, I'm sure... I'm sure we've all seen a picture of this. It's, it's a bell curve. You know, that evil racist bell curve. You know, you use it for various kinds of distributions of natural phenomena. Now, let's suppose that here we actually have two populations, call them A and B, and since I know that uh, the dogma of the Sandre, of the Muppet Farm, is such that 
uh, the, the distributions work one way for all subjects except for race, and then they operate completely differently. So we will take race out of this and we'll just talk about the average height differences between men and women. So group A, I, I better write this down before I get confused. A, men. B, woe men. So this is going to be their height. So you have two populations, A and B. And we're going to say, we're going to start from the premise that they're equal. In every possible respect, these two populations have perfectly identical uh, parameters. So if you put them on the same uh, graph, they overlap. Okay? So then the question becomes, and you have your, uh, your measure here of the central tendency of, of the data. Uh, so then the question is, if you choose one man and one woman, so you choose in pairs, man, woman, man, woman, uh, or you could choose man, 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 woman, 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 woman. Uh, what are the odds that uh, the first person you choose will be taller than the second person that you choose? Another way to say that is, what are the odds that you'll choose someone from this side uh, or someone from that side in some particular order? Well, because they're perfectly identical, it's symmetric and whatnot. Uh, on an average number of runs, you expect that half the time you'll get someone from here, half the time you'll get someone from there, and it's going to work out. Sometimes you might get, you know, when you draw it might be uh, a man and woman from the same side, but the next time it might be uh, man, woman, man, woman, or man, 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 or something like that. But over a large number of trials, on average, it's going to work itself out. So, you know, that's what the distribution says. That on average, this is what you expect. But since uh, we're, going, we're going to get away from just theoretical stuff to the real world where there are actual differences, we're going to have to take A and B and uh, decouple them. So we'll have to have two bell curves that overlap. Okay, so uh, A, B. They each have their measure of central tendency. All right. Now, Sandre looks at this graph, and he says, well, when this population B is lower than A, what that implies is that if you're drawing randomly, uh, <laughs> and you want to ask about, you know, which one's going to be higher, on average, uh, you will draw from this side more frequently. Now, let me erase B here and reacquaint the Sandre guy with something called the empirical rule. And by reacquaint, I mean possibly tell him for the first time because I'm a bit dubious he's actually a science student. But anyway, um, so the empirical rule is a way of breaking things up by standard deviations, which are standardized so that... Uh, Stephen Pinker has a talk on logic. Um, you use logic so when you're dealing with things that are actually different, like whether it be drinks or cards or whatever it is, that uh, even though the objects you're using are different, they will have logical relationships between one another, and logic is our way of not being confused by the particulars of the objects. Sandre has not learned this lesson. Standard deviations are a way to talk about data without respect to whatever the particular thing, whether it's height, race, IQ, shoe size, whatever it is, without having to get into the details of the particular uh, objects with which you're dealing. And the empirical rule tells you that a certain percentage of the data is trapped within the first standard deviation. A second uh, proportion of the data, smaller than the first, is trapped within the second standard deviation. And yet, in the third standard deviation, a smaller proportion of the data will be captured. And so we're going to con confine ourselves. It's, it's about 97% within three which gives you a space of six. So one, two, three, four. So, you, well, that's not very well drawn, but I don't claim to be an artist. So um, right here is about 68% of the data. And then you go out and then out, and you'll have to forgive my mark. My drawing is absolutely horrible. My, my pictures aren't good, as my video will attest. Uh, Art is not my forte. I'm a minimalist. <laughs> anyway, so when you take a population and, and you shift just a little bit, what you're doing is you're taking from the, uh, you know, the height here and this width, 
that portion of the population. So even though it's a small shift, because so much of the data is clustered this close to the center, it's actually a significant proportion of the population. You know, 34-ish percent of the population is in this little column, 34 percent there, and then out here you get very, very small percentages. And so the bulk of the data that you're going to be moving will be from this first standard deviation, or this, the first two standard deviations. Now, when you separate uh, group A from group B like I did, and you have them overlap, another way to think about this is the weighting of how the population is being separated and where you're looking from. And so I will uh, attempt to use a useful analogy here to describe that. So I want you to think of uh, a hot air balloon or maybe a water balloon, since water's not compressible, depending on how detailed you want to be. Or um, you can watch on YouTube here, there's a video of, there's a kid sitting on an air mattress and like a bigger brother, bigger sister, I can't remember now, jumps on it and it launches the kid into the wall, just into the air and it specks him into the wall. That's because the air from one side is being compressed and has to move somewhere else. And so the compression that's caused by squeezing here causes it to bulge over there. And if you happen to be on this uh, the perimeter here, when that bulge happens rapidly, <laughs> you discover Newton's laws. Don't ever let Newton uh, drive you unattended. He doesn't even have a license to fly. Anyway, so the, uh, the, the trace here is actually what constrains the data, but if we're going to use a real analogy of real objects in the real world, then we're going to suppose that this trace here, this line, the curve, is actually held up by some material that pushes out on it, like air or water. So we can't just compress it. When, um, I mean, we can compress it, even though you can't really compress a graph in that way. So when you take the two graphs like I did earlier and you shift one to the left, what you are effectively doing, as I mentioned, is you're shifting the population. Another way to say that is you take uh, ethno-nationalist uh, shovel hands and you reach into the population, you scoop out some people and then you move them over there. And then you scoop out some people and you move them over there. And since the the way this distribution function works is it's a, you know it's not linear as you can see. There's more here. What that is saying is that when you do a random draw, when you just reach in randomly, you're likelier to get uh, people from the places that are most dense, where the most density exists, which is in this area here. You're less likely to get them far away where there are fewer options uh, to draw, to find someone there. Or if you think about a, a city that's in a perfect circle and it's uh, four quadrants, and you suppose that it's, uh, the population is uniformly distributed, uh, it's like taking you know, all the people from here and moving them over there. And then you're asking about, you know, if you, you know, partition it here and you draw, what are you likely to get you partition here, partition there? Well, once you've moved all these people here, you're going to start getting an imbalance in your return when you, you know, section the graph that way and you draw, you're going to find, well, because there are zero people here, you have zero opportunities to find someone there. And because that population has been moved here, this population here is more dense, so you're much, uh, you know, your odds of finding someone there, well, they're much better because there are actual people here and none there, uh, are going to be improved if you section it the other way. Because this population is more dense than that population. Because there are more opportunities for an event to happen, the events will happen more frequently. So anyway, that's... I hope that analogy doesn't go up anybody's ass, except for the alternative hypothesis, because you know. Sir... I appreciate your efforts at meat browning. Anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to scoop out some people and scoot them over here. Well, when we reach in and snatch those people out, I'm sorry, because we're talking about women, I probably, I probably shouldn't use the word snatch, it's, it's probably misogyny. When we gently reach in and empower them to move to the other side of the, of the train tracks, what happens is our curve, uh, you know, there's less pressure pushing pushing on it, so it does that. Well, we've stuffed these people in here, and since we're using an analogy of air or water, that means it's got to cause a bulge here. You know, we didn't move a lot of people, so it's only going to skew it a little bit. Well, then we're going to repeat that. We're going to reach in and snatch, I'm sorry, uh, empower these people, to encourage these people to move to the, uh, the, wrong, the right side, the left side of the, the tracks here, 
and you're going to repeat that process. And so eventually what happens is that uh, you get this skewed kind of graph, which is, this is not to scale by the way. I'm, I know I've mentioned this a few times already, my drawing is horrible. But you also get this, this bulge here. So the original graph now looks like uh, it's been transformed to look something like this. Now what Sandre says is that once this has happened, once you have shifted so much of that population to the left of the, the value we're interested in, the likeliest place that you are going to find uh, an event is here. Sandre does not know what he's talking about. Uh, the scientists who were on that side are so blinded by their ideology that they are so indoctrinated into the notion that legal equality bespeaks actual equality uh, in all you know, important respects that they don't gainsay this when the student says this. The one time they had a professional scientist that I'm aware of, uh, that, I'm sorry, in video, in audio that's been leaked, a professional scientist go in and try to correct Sandre. Sandre kept telling him, not he didn't tell him to shut up, but he kept over-talking him. No, 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 you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, dude, I bet you're fun to be in class with when you feel deeply because you've been indoctrinated to believe uh, certain properties about various elements. Uh, not fringe elements, by the way. I mean, real elements. And your professor says something that, like, messes with your noggin. You go, no, you're wrong. I'm a chemistry student. You don't know what you're talking about. Because Jajon explained this to me, whoever Jajon is. Now, Sandre also has another, uh, a number of other problems. Um, <laughs> let me erase this. So I think uh, um, JF went over the margin of error problems. Uh, but in the margin of error problem, uh, Sandre was talking about how if the margin of error, I'm sorry, if the effect is really small, you have to discount it. This is about the dumbest thing I think a chemistry person could ever say. <laughs> Those atoms that you deal with are, I'm told, <laughs> not particularly large. And I'm wondering why, in 1999, the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given out for femtochemistry. That's chemistry done at the femto scale. Presumably, uh, they should take that, well, they can't take away the guy's dead now, uh, but you know, they should, they should not have given that Nobel Prize because, after all, at the femto scale, everything, the effect is going to be small because it's at the femto scale, and you should discount it. Um, now, I'm, I'm told that we can measure the distance of the moon to within centimeters out of, you know, the hundreds of thousands of miles. We have to discount that. We can't know that the moon is receding because we only measure it, and because the measurement is very tiny, you have to discount it. Sandre doesn't know, uh, seem to know, about um, sample sizes and statistical power, error rates, these types of things. Uh, it's the same kind of problems that I find in social science when I read feminist literature. They don't understand the statistics. And I'm not here talking about the details of how this equation works or how that. I'm talking about the broad ideas. Uh, you know, whether or not the person can sit there and actually derive it all or prove it <clears throat> is not a matter for me. It's whether or not they understand the basic principles. And one of which with respect to sample size is the larger your sample size gets, um, you smooth out certain types of errors so you smooth out certain types of data. But you also get fluctuations there uh, in the data uh, that are real. They aren't false positives. Because the, the larger your sample size is, the better, you, better able you are to detect real effects. You still have to worry about false positives, uh, but there will be real effects in there. And if you can't distinguish that, if you can't separate those two concepts in your mind, that increasing your sample size improves your ability to, de to, de uh, to detect real but ever smaller effects, then you need to get the fuck out of science. You're incompetent. Now, the only way to perfectly smooth the data, and, uh, so that way any fluctuations you get are, are really there, that is perfectly true, is to do a particular kind of sample, which is of the entire population, called a census. Uh, because when you do a census, Assuming you don't get any computational errors, no human notation errors, no, nothing's transposed, no sheets, and no data is lost. You know, assuming perfect people involved in a perfectly conducted trial, perfectly conducted experiment, where everything is tested 
uh, simultaneously or in such fashion that uh, no data can sneak through the cracks. So assume it's perfect. You will get a true measure in every respect that you're interested in. There will be no error at all. Now, when you're doing statistics, that is never true. Statistics assumes, uh, you know, it, it, it is a false assumption, but it assumes what would we get if we did a perfect experiment? What would still be true if we had perfect people with perfect equipment that was perfectly accurate, extremely precise, never made a mistake, no data could possibly be lost? What would still happen? We would still have this error rate that we can't get away from. We are stuck with this problem no matter what. And you're always going to be stuck with that problem. And now, that's why it's very important to have good experimental design, uh, to be really careful and meticulous about how you collect your data, how you set up your experiments, what your assumptions are, and all these types of things. It's very expensive to do that. It's far more expensive to conduct a census, particularly when what you're, look, depending on the science you're in, you might be thinking about, I don't know, I've mentioned the example of hydrogen atoms, and I corrected Sandre on his false uh, assertion about the nature of hydrogen atoms, or his possibly false assertion, I should say, about hydrogen, how hydrogen atoms in the universe actually work. We only have uh, models about how they work based on statistics. You know, the things you can't use to detect small effects, which when, once found you have to d discard them. Because we cannot do the census of all hydrogen atoms in the universe simultaneously to make sure that in fact they all have this one particular property without variation. Now, in my video where I mention that, someone says, no, it's definitional because it, you know, the hydrogen atom has the one electron. True as you tell it. That's a definitional component. That is not the proposition, though, because the proposition was about the number of bonds that hydrogen atoms make. It is only an assumption of a model, a model-dependent reality, that uh, they won't make, uh, I think it was quadruple or quintuple bonds. Now, we have no evidence that this happens, we also have no evidence that it doesn't happen, and there's a certain amount of information that we can't get because there's a fundamental limit to the amount to which we can sample the universe. We can't take a census. So you always have to accept that there, this error rate exists, and it does not go away in mathematics. And this, now, I make a lot of very confident statements <coughs> about mathematics because I understand it very well, and I also know its limitations, and I know uh, when, someone, when someone's going to bring up one of those limitations, I also know the rebuttal to the limitations about why that, that actual limitation, that actual problem, isn't a problem in respect of this issue, or if it is, then it is, and if it isn't, then it isn't. I know, um, like Feynman say, you'll have the standard model of any particular theory, and then every you know, scientist or working mathematician or physicist, chemist, whatever it is, worth of salt will know five, six alternates to that model that uh, are equally compatible with the data. Um, you know, and we choose models not, you know, it's possible to have uh, two models, have the same number of assumptions, uh, and, you know, they are equivalent logically, e equivalent logically, nevertheless we will choose one for psychological reasons, because it's advantageous for other reasons. So, in mathematics, we have a fundamental problem that we don't talk about a great deal, because it's insoluble, namely in that we don't know if mathematics itself is even consistent. So, in the physical universe, there are limits to human knowledge. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle attests that. No matter what you do, how good you get, there's always a little bit of information there you won't have access to. That means there's a fundamental limit to what we can learn about the universe. Everything else aside, that bare fact, I'm sorry, that piece of data that only tells you the data, actually implies that there is an upper limit beyond which we simply cannot go in respect of learning about the universe. So too in mathematics. Um, if you, uh, when I do, I mentioned this, when I do talking about math, when I talk about math in, in a video <clears throat> that's not specifically about teaching math, I very uh, often don't use a lot of notation because it's a barrier to communication. But uh, I'll get really fancy here. I have used some mathematical notation, 0 and 1. Now, I was talking about um, near certainty, uh, almost certainty, in respect of infinitesimals. And then I had to quit the video because my battery was dying. I've got it plugged in today, so don't worry about that. 
<laughs> Checkmate there, battery. Um, anyway, and some people quite uh, quite rightly question me about, well, what's the alternate, the, the other side of the argument that you didn't actually get to get to? And, um, well, it's just the complement of the argument that I made, because that's how probabilities work. The probability that an event will occur is 1 minus the probability that it won't occur, or vice versa. So, um, anyway, when dealing with the infinite, no one, not even Sandre, his uh, assertions to the contrary notwithstanding, his delusions of adequacy, uh, there's no restriction on what I'm about to say, uh, no one can imagine it. It's Whenever you get beyond medium-sized objects traveling at average speeds, uh, or below that, so you get the very fast, the very large, uh, or the very tiny, we don't have an intuitive way to deal with that. And that causes us reasoning problems, like you can see here. And by the way, you know how high, you, you often can tell how high level of mathematics you're in by how few numbers actually show up. And when, you, when it's just ones and zeros, <laughs> you might be getting into some crazy kooky shit. So uh, if you take real analysis, what you'll learn uh, is that in the same way that we can't imagine infinities, there's a problem there for us, we also have a very difficult time getting very close to things. And this is where my argument in my other video uh, was when I said that uh, eventually you find a number that is smaller than every possible positive real number, and therefore it has to be zero. So in real analysis, uh, you might be wondering, you might have an occasion, because your professor will make you, ask yourself the question, what is the smallest number next to zero? And the answer is, there isn't one. No such number exists. And yet, it must exist. <laughs> because it's continuous. So it has to be there, and yet it's not really there. Okay, anyway. So what do I mean? Uh, pick any number, you know, maybe you think of, I'll, I'll guess point zero 0.01. And I say, ah, that's pretty good. But I, what about point zero zero 0.001? And you think a little while, and you say, well, I'm going to improve my, my uh, chances here. So you got a, a gazillion zeros, however many you want. And you can keep adding those zeros until the entropic heat death of the universe for all you want. And when you get to the end of that process, what your professor is going to say is, that is fantastic. Now, that number that you just came up with, I'm going to divide by 2. And so you think, well, golly gee, let me try to improve it again. And every time you come up with a better uh, guess, I'm just going to divide that by 2. Uh, same thing on the on you know, when you scale that up going to infinity, when you talk about uh, the transition between finite numbers and infinite numbers and how that happens, it's a very difficult problem uh, because you know what is if if there's not an infinity there, what is the largest number? This is actually a debate in mathematics. What is the largest number? Any number you choose. All I'm going to say is okay, you've chosen the number n. I'm just going to add one to it, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. <laughs> So these problems uh, are there. Uh, what I should say is these problems are here. It's not a problem for the mathematics. It's a problem for us to reason about uh, the mathematics. Because we weren't built, we, were, we did not evolve to address these types of issues. And therefore, they're very alien to us. In the same way we didn't evolve, we didn't originate in a universe where we are designed or made, evolve, whatever you, however you think we got here, to appreciate what it means to move orthogonally from three dimensions, you know, at 90 degrees from all the axes that you know and can understand. No conception of that whatever. No one has it. Anyone who tells you they understand that, like they really get it intuitively, is lying uh, to you and is delusional. And uh, you should say, thank you, please shut up and go away. All right, uh, so Sandre, if you do make your video, I'm quite ready for you, and to all the other ac academics who are working with Kraut at his Muppet farm. I'm ready for all of you, again. One monkey, one marker. Come get me, motherfuckers. Everybody else, have a great day. <laughs>